operate on this planet or we will make ourselves obsolete. That's the defining moment and we have to put the technologies in place where they belong. They have to be then assistant to our goals. Well, many people, if I say that, would say, yes, yes, of course, makes sense. But <laughs> I have not understood that this is not where we are now. We are now defining future visions through technology lenses. But I want to turn it around. I want that we have a collective vision where we want to be and how we want to design our environment and our food system that operates within the planetary boundaries as scientists have been defining it, where it respects the rules of the planet and not vice versa, that we manipulate our planet to the point where it meets our needs in economic terms. For me, progress is a continuous improvement of existing things. Uh, because I have the impression that, uh, let's call it the old continent, uh, Europe, is slowing down a little bit in making progress. If decisions are taken on emotion, one day left, the other day right, this is not the basis of a sustainable farming. What progress do we want? Are we willing to um, trade off some of the uh, benefits for some of the risk? Because we're facing a world which is more and more globalized, so we are up against uh, other parts of the world which do not always play with the same rules. We're living in a very strange place today because we have on the one hand challenges of obesity and overweight and on the other hand we have challenges of undernutrition, uh, malnutrition and starvation. There are geopolitical issues in parts of the world where there is less food and we need to find ways to get food to those parts of the world either through aid or through producing it themselves and to produce more food on the same amount of land because we can't use more land, we can't use more resources. no ha conseguido de momento que se pueda comer de forma saludable y asequible económicamente eh, sin utilizar miles de toneladas de plaguicidas cada año. Claro que hay un problema muy gordo, ambiental y médico. Do you imagine the number of chronic diseases that are in every family today? It is not due to new viruses or new microbes that have been found in all breast cancers, for instance. That's not true. So it is due to environment and to chronic poisons that are in environment. What are the chronic poisons designed to be toxic initially and spread all over the place? Pesticides. Cuando yo acabé la carrera en el año 77, el cáncer de mama era algo que le daba a las mujeres de 78 años que tenían una pupa en la mama que nunca se le habían enseñado a su médico no fuera a ser mala. Y ahora es mujeres de 33 años que vienen con un cáncer de mama inflamatorio metastásico. Y nos miramos todos, los más viejos, a la derecha y izquierda diciendo ¿Pero esto de dónde ha salido?
Hay un déficit de investigación sobre tóxicos, salud pública y medio ambiente brutal, brutal. Pero no cometamos el error de pedirle a la industria farmacéutica que investigue sobre las causas de las enfermedades, porque no hay negocio ahí. Y es legítimo querer ganar dinero. El ciudadano tiene que saber qué cantidad de sustancias que pueden ir desde el chupete de un niño hasta lo que come, respira, bebe, eh, donde se acuesta, todos los bienes de consumo, muy pocas de las sustancias pasan los controles de si son tóxicas para la reproducción, para el sistema hormonal o cancerígenas. Hasta que no empieza a haber sospechas y esto se regula, pueden pasar décadas. Cuando nos dicen, no, es que los residuos no superan el límite máximo de residuos, digo, tío, estaría bueno que encima los estuvieran superando. No es que la Unión Europea y los gobiernos tratan mucho de que los residuos de compuestos químicos no superen aquellos números de seguridad, LMRs, que han sido... Y le decimos, tío, que estamos en el siglo XXI, en un país civilizado, estaría bueno que además de todo lo que tenemos montado, hubiera crimen. Lástima que esté calculado todo para productos individuales y que un tomate tenga siete tratamientos. Y me gustaría que me diera si esa información toxicológica que tienes para un residuo sirve para los siete que tiene el tomate, que son distintos y que probablemente actúan por mecanismos comunes. Es más, me gustaría que me dijeran lo mismo para la ensalada que tiene tomate, lechuga y zanahoria. Es más, me gustaría que me dijeran lo mismo para el bistec de ternera, la ensalada y la sopita que me he tomado. No. Eso no. El cálculo se hace para compuestos individuales, porque la única responsabilidad que hay detrás es el límite de residuo individual para compuestos individuales y la toxicología individual. Dices, pero eso no es el plato de mi día. No. Porque el plato de tu día ha aportado esos residuos, más los residuos del plástico, más los residuos de la elaboración en una sartén de compuestos perflorados, con una rasera de polibromados. Es decir, al final, ¿dónde me han metido? So all these chemical compounds are out, made out of petroleum. Petroleum is a fossil fuel, very sticky, and it is bioaccumulative because it's a fossil compound which lasts long. This is why it gives toxicity in livers and in kidneys and cancer because it gives the disease that are the disruption of communication. In a cancer, the first reason you have cancer is because your cell cannot communicate each other anymore with the, the rest of the body. And hormonal diseases, it's the same problem. Nervous diseases like Parkinson, Alzheimer, or even depression, it's the same problem. Also, immune disease or uh, other malformations in the babies, it's also the same problem. The cell cannot communicate. But this happens on a long term, so that means several years, several dozens of years. So you cannot see because you drink a glass of wine with pesticides or a piece of bread with pesticides, you cannot see this effect immediately. Many of the opponents to modern agriculture have understood that it's, um, it's easy to, to scare uh, people, it's easy to, um, to use fear as a strong emotional um, driver 
for changing policy and for influencing policy. But sometimes it's in the interests of the anti-industry groups to do that, of course, because it keeps them at work, and brings in money for them as well. So I think we should look at this from both sides. We sometimes have visits from them. Recently they invaded this building and they have done so before and threw manure and threatening letters and stuff at us, but okay. That's part of the game, I suppose. We do not, we, you know, when we fight against, when we fight against, when we try and dialogue with people like that, we don't have the same weapons. I sometimes have the feeling that we have bows and arrows and they have atom bombs. As soon as there's an NGO or a group of people who are against something, maybe, maybe they ban it, maybe they stop using it, maybe they stop importing it. So in terms of development and trust, I think we risk losing a lot of trust as a region. When I say industry has the truth, we know what's in our products, for example. Like that, if I, if I make a product, I mean, you can go home this evening and make a paella in your kitchen and you know what's in there and you write it down. That is the truth. Sorry, but you know, we are an industry. We know what we put in our products. We can tell you this is the truth. This is what we put in our, in our products. When I say we have the truth, I'm talking about, uh, I'm not talking about philosophically the truth. I'm talking about what we do. We know what we do and we can talk about it. Pendant maintenant 30 ans, j'ai travaillé dans le domaine de l'évaluation des effets sur la santé des pesticides, des OGM, des polluants en général. J'ai vu d'abord que les industriels donnaient toujours le même dossier partout dans le monde et que euh, les agences faisaient évidemment des, des évaluations, mais elles, elles lisaient les dossiers des industriels. Prenons par exemple le cas du principal pesticide du monde qu'on a retrouvé dans, dans les glaces, qu'on a retrouvé dans les vins, qu'on a retrouvé dans l'urine des gens, le Ronda. D'abord, c'est Monsanto qui fait le dossier. Mais la composition du produit, elle est confidentielle. Nous, on a trouvé dans le produit, très récemment en 2017, caché des poisons très toxiques, de l'arsenic, des résidus de pétrole, qui n'étaient pas déclarés. Ils disent c'est du glyphosate. Mais ça n'est pas que du glyphosate. C'est une fraude de dire qu'il y a juste le glyphosate. Donc la composition... C'est eux qui décident quel est le produit toxique qu'ils vont déclarer dedans. Et ils ne vont en évaluer qu'un seul, le glyphosate. Ils ont choisi qui est le moins toxique du Roundup. Et ils le donnent à des rats, le glyphosate, pendant deux ans. Mais quand ils ont fini, les analyses de sang des animaux sont confidentielles. Donc on a un produit confidentiel et des effets sur la santé confidentiels pour la communauté scientifique, pour le commun des mortels, pour les consommateurs, pour tout le monde. Sauf pour que quelques personnes à l'EFSA ou à la FDA ou à Faisans en Australie ou à, dans des agences. Et il se trouve que ces gens-là sont compromis. Ça a été révélé par les Monsanto Papers. With direct bullion, you can start your collection of loose or certified gold coins and bullion bars for as little as 50 pounds. All the gold they sell is VAT free. Their specialists are on hand to guide and support their customers. And if the time comes, direct bullion will even buy your gold back. That's why they're a top recommended precious metals dealer by the Spears 500. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 0800 055 7050. Bullion by Post is the UK's number one online bullion dealer. At Bullion by Post we make it easy to buy and sell gold and silver. We stock a wide range of coins, bars and collectibles. Bullion by Post have delivered over 300,000 orders and are proud to have received over 19,000 customer reviews. All orders include free insured delivery. We also offer secure storage. For live prices or to find out more call 0800 825 0000 or visit bullionbypost.co.uk.
Our headline stories this hour, over four years in the making, a landmark trade deal between the UK and EU is finally struck, bringing an end to the Brexit saga and Great Britain's membership within the European Union. A plane carrying Sputnik V. Supplies from Moscow arrives in Argentina after the South American country officially registers the Russian... Sign off. The Democrats suffer another setback trying to boost payments to struggling Americans. Also... I'm Scott Heidler in Bangkok, Thailand, often described as the Venice of the East. Many of the 10 million people here use the waterways to get around, but the boats are big polluters, so the city is putting greener versions on the water. Well, it's been eight months of tense talks and it comes just seven days before the deadline. The European Union and the UK have managed to reach a trade deal. The agreement for zero tariff, zero quota relationship covers everything from energy to what became the crucial issue of fish. The EU won protection for a level playing field on regulation, while the UK avoided a future role for the European Court of Justice. Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson claimed he delivered the promises of the 2016 vote to leave, with his country no longer bound by EU rules. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said EU rules will be respected by a balanced deal which protects the interests of member states. Is that the end of the story? Not quite yet. Ambassadors from the 27 EU members will meet on Friday, Christmas Day, to discuss it, while British MPs will be recalled for a vote next Wednesday. Both must agree by midnight on the 31st for the deal to become official. Rory Challens has our report. Finally, Brexit is done. Four and a half years after the referendum, almost at the end of the 11-month transition period. The UK and the EU argued, negotiated, compromised and cajoled, but they've done what many feared they couldn't and agreed their future trading relationship. It's a moment of reflection for the European Commission President. At the end of a successful negotiations journey, I normally feel joy. But today, I only feel quite satisfaction and, frankly speaking, relief. For the UK's Prime Minister, it's a political success that caps a year which gave him very few of them. There will be no uh, palisade of tariffs on January the 1st, and there'll be no non-tariff barriers to, to trade. Uh, instead, there will be a giant free trade zone of which we will at once be a member and at the same time be able to do our own free trade deals. One area of dispute that's seen compromise is fishing rights. Outside the EU, Britain has control of its exclusive economic zone, but it's had to budge on how much access EU trawlers have. There's also been movement on state aid to allay EU fears European companies could suffer from unfair competition. We now both have an imperative to work together to make this deal uh, look as good and run as smoothly as possible, and that will minimise short-term disruption. The government's independent spending watchdog says not reaching a deal would have knocked 2% off UK growth in 2021 alone, partly because of temporary disruptions to cross-border trade. But even with this deal, UK businesses still have plenty to worry about. Only a small number of transport companies have had access to Britain's new border crossing software, expected to be rolled out just a week before the transition period ends. There are concerns about Britain's current jobs crisis deepening if firms relocate to the EU. And there are still unanswered questions about how to avoid physical border checks between Northern Ireland, part of the UK, and Ireland, an EU member. For now, both sides will be happy to have something to show for the tortuous negotiations. Boris Johnson insists the relationship is still close. This country will remain culturally, emotionally, historically, strategically, geologically attached to Europe. But in the year of Covid, the UK has finally done what the 2016 referendum result demanded. It's distanced itself from Europe. Rory Challenge, Al Jazeera. So the deal's been done. 
And uh, But we want to take a look at the content then and whether either side has, has fared better. Principally, it secures a zero tariff, zero quota market for goods, sidestepping the possibility that prices on both sides could have soared, forcing businesses to fold or suffer deeply. On the key British issue of access to fish in UK waters, EU boats will keep access for five and a half years, but the size of their catch will shrink. The UK fishing industry says it's disappointed there isn't more of a break from the EU. For Europe, a key demand was protecting that level playing field, common rules to stop one side gaining a competitive advantage over the other. It says there will be built-in safeguards with incentives to stick to it. Beyond all of this, there are deals covering transport, data sharing and health and agreements on law enforcement, for example, smoothing the process of extradition. But it won't be as swift as before. Also, under the terms of the deal, the UK has opted out of the Erasmus student program. Uh, Britons will no longer be able to avoid mobile phone roaming charges and there'll be more paperwork if they want to travel with their pets. Well, earlier I spoke to Mushtaba Rahman, the managing director for Europe at the risk consultancy Eurasia Group, also works as an economist for the European Commission and the UK's Treasury. He said that he expects the UK will begin to substantively diverge from the EU. I think both sides have moved, as, as was expected in any trade negotiation, um, frankly, of this importance. The UK has moved off some of its red lines. Uh, the European Union has done the same. And frankly, I think the discussion over who compromised more is a bit academic at this point, because the ratification process, which will take place next week on both sides, will go through on both sides. I think there's very little risk that it's either torpedoed in the Commons uh, or that the member states um, decide that there's something about the agreement that they don't like. So who compromised more, who compromised less is actually something of an academic discussion now. There is a new agreement. It will come into effect on the 1st of January. As European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said, this is the end, but it's also the beginning. And a senior French source said exactly the same to me. I think it's a bit early to judge the direction of travel for the two sides now. But my own sense is this government wants to do things differently. That was the purpose of Brexiting. It will want to symbolically diverge, substantively diverge. Two new strains of the coronavirus have emerged in Africa with separate mutations recorded in Nigeria and South Africa. The new variant in South Africa is believed to be more infectious, contributing to what experts have called an alarming rate of contagion. The country's total number of cases is rapidly approaching one million. Several nations have restricted travel from South Africa as a precaution. Al Jazeera's Hara Mutasa is in Johannesburg. This new variant in South Africa was identified in KwaZulu-Natal province, the Eastern Cape and the Garden Route. That's along the Cape Town area. The health minister says the numbers are alarming. More than 14,000 new infections in the last 24 hours. And he's recommending more restrictive measures be put in place. The measures already in place include a nighttime curfew. Alcohol can only be sold on certain days and at certain times. And some beaches have been closed. But health officials say some South African cities seem not to be listening to the warnings. They're saying some of them are posting pictures on social media, photos and videos of them at big parties called super spreader events where they aren't wearing masks and they aren't practicing social distancing. The government, what it's trying to do is to try and make sure enough hospital beds are available across the country in government and private facilities. So in some provinces, for example, some doctors are discharging patients that they think are stable. Those people are being told to go home to make way for COVID-19 patients. Additional staff have been put on standby. There's talk that in some areas, military doctors and nurses may be called in if it does get to that stage. The health officials are also warning that if these infections keep rising, South Africa could reach its peak within the next two weeks. It's a similar scenario across the continent. Infection rates are rising and more countries are imposing more restrictive measures. For example, Botswana is the latest country to impose a nighttime curfew. Malawi has said it's closing its borders for at least 14 days. Officials here are concerned that as more and more people keep traveling, uh, especially around the festive season, there could be an increase in infections, not just in this part of Africa, but the rest of the continent as well. Relief checks promised to millions of Americans are still on hold as politicians bicker over changes to the package. 
Democrats and Republicans are in a tit-for-tat struggle over changes to that $2 trillion plan. It comes after President Trump said the $600 individual payments were too small and called for $2,000 per person. Instead, Democrats supported the rise. Republicans are blocking it. Rosalind Jordan is in Washington and joins us now. And uh, the risk that everyone is talking about is the prospect of President Trump refusing to sign the relief package. That's right. Even though the president has not threatened an actual veto of this legislation, he has been very critical of the measure for, among other reasons, the fact that the uh, one-time uh, stimulus checks to um, Americans uh, making under $150,000 if they're married or under $75,000 if they're single, uh, he says that's not enough money, even though that is not what his negotiators had worked out with members of Congress when they were trying to come up with this $900 billion uh, stimulus plan that was agreed to earlier in the week. If, you know, he does really feels that strongly about it, he could veto the bill. The bill is being sent to his home in Florida where he is spending the Christmas holiday. Now, there are other things that the president doesn't like about the bill, namely the fact that there is a no uh, review or re revocation of a law that essentially protects social media companies, companies which the president has accused of being anti-conservative or anti-Trump, depending on your perspective. Uh, certainly, uh, the president is also upset about the fact that this legislation would try to uh, deal with the renaming of uh, some uh, U.S. military installations that were uh, named for uh, Confederate soldiers, uh, people who were considered to be traitors to their country after the U.S. Civil War of the 19th century. He doesn't think that those military installations should be renamed. But all of that is really the political process that people here in Washington get fixated on. What really matters is the fact that if the president does not sign this legislation or if he vetoes the legislation, which is a fancy word for rejecting it, that means that people who could be getting more unemployment payments won't be getting it. It means that businesses that could be getting more financial assistance in the middle of the pandemic won't get it. And it means that perhaps just as important that the federal government could close at the end of the day on Monday because there's not enough funding that's been authorized to go past this coming Monday, the 28th. So there's a lot riding on whether the president actually signs this bill. Thank you. From Washington, Rosalind Jordan. Meanwhile here, thousands of truck drivers will remain stranded at the English port of Dover for Christmas Day, waiting on negative coronavirus test results. So far, only three drivers have tested positive, with more than 2,300 getting the all clear ahead of their chance to cross the English Channel. Fewer than 100 vehicles had left the port on Wednesday evening. Most are likely to have spent a total of five nights in their vehicle, with limited food, water and access to sanitation. Well, one of the people stuck at Dover was Ronald Schroeder, a boat importer from Germany. After days being stuck at the port, he's finally en route to be with his family on Christmas Day. He uh, told us about his experience. Yesterday, I went to Gatwick to get a corona test. At four o'clock this morning, I waked up, went into the line at the harbor. At eight o'clock, the authorities did not accept my test from yesterday. I had to make a quick test from NHS and the result was negative, so I could pass the border. Christmas at home with my daughter, with my son, with my wife. It's a great feeling. About the organization of the British government during this crisis, no shops open, no drinks, no coffee, no facility down at the harbour. The availability of tests were very low. For me it looks like that the ships are empty, that, uh, that there are not enough tests. That's the only reason why, because there are enough tra trucks up the hill. I think the organization of this crisis is, has totally failed. I'm on board in the FDA ship Le Havre now. Uh, the ship is now just leaving Dover Harbor after 
four days locked up here or five days and I'm happy to go home. You're watching Al Jazeera live from London coming up after a quick break. We're going to t turn to Iraq uh, because there have been protests there. Prices are skyrocketing after the biggest currency devaluation since the fall of Saddam Hussein. And a shot in the arm for Argentina's coronavirus defences. 300,000 doses of Russia's Sputnik vaccine arrive in the country. Coins and bullion bars. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 0800 to explain this deal to them. I think this will now go through and on January 1st be put in place. But at the end of this, this letter that I've seen from Ursula von der Leyen, very interesting how she sums up the state of play. Uh, she says we have to respect the decision of the UK, but says, as democracies and neighbours, our destinies are intertwined and woven together by common history of friendship and hope, something which will not change at the dawn of the new year. Very poetic, very romantic, but the simple fact is that actually the UK is about to leave the club and it is about to become a competitor. Listen to all of those things that are in these, these two agreements. This is about a different world where the UK and the EU will no longer be working together, where perhaps the rules will be pushed, will be infringed. There are many people in Brussels who expect Boris Johnson to want to have some kind of dust up to prove his mettle and to go to these dispute uh, resolution mechanisms that have been talked about in this deal. And the same with the European Union. They expect more friction, not just on the borders, but in the world of politics. It could be quite some spectacle. It will indeed, Adam. OK, thank you. So, Joe, a historic moment this, but also, I suppose, a personal moment for Boris Johnson, a moment of triumph for him. It certainly is, Isabel. He has been fighting for this for almost five years. We can trace it back to a decision, a decision he said was agonisingly difficult back in February 2016. That, of course, was the moment when he decided to back Brexit. That moment, that choice was incredibly consequential, not just for uh, Boris Johnson's career, his rise to the Conservative Party, but consequential for this country and for all of our lives. What he has achieved today was, is something that Theresa May, his predecessor, was unable to achieve. But what is perhaps remarkable is that so far there has not really been that much opposition, that much flack. Nigel Farage, the Brexit Party leader, saying tonight the deal's not perfect, but it is a big step forward. The only significant opposition seemingly coming from the Scottish National Party and most importantly, Labour leader Keir Starmer saying that his MPs will be whipped to back the government, back the deal, all but guaranteeing its path through Parliament. But Boris Johnson still has one big challenge ahead and that is about is to prove that all of this wrangling, all of this stress, all of this division was worth it. We don't have all of the text, the details of this deal, more slogans and sound bites really for now, but whatever comes out in the coming days, Boris Johnson has always claimed the UK can make a success of Brexit. Now he has to prove it. OK, Joe in Downing Street and Adam in Brussels, thank you both very much. And we will be bringing you the Prime Minister's statement in full. That is at half past this hour, plus a little later, the European Union's press conference repeated at half past 11 right here on Sky News. And it didn't cost much more than normal homes did, so I would recommend that people uh, come and visit that. Now, the Assembly also wanted leadership from government. And I think there is a good story to tell there, the first country to legislate for net zero, a landmark environment bill that will set our new governance for, for a whole... ...to approach the US to do a significant uh, free trade agreement, perhaps. Uh, not this mini deal that the current US administration is talking about, but a bona fide free trade agreement. And I think, you know, the US, I think, generally would be receptive to that. It was not the case, certainly, you know, several weeks ago when the Irish border was an issue. But with, I think, that that clear, mm. I think there would be, you know, much more interest now in the U.S. Let's talk, let's talk um, world trade deals. We heard um, 
Mr. Mr. Barnier talk about the fact that it was unfortunate that this took place at such an uncertain and unstable time. When you've got economic powerhouses like the EU, you've got the US, you've now got Asia, which has just struck the RCEP deal, and of course you've got the United States, was this a good time to go it alone? Well, that, you know, <laughs> that decision was, was taken some time ago, as we all know. Uh, and once, once the UK decided to leave the European Union, there was no turning back in terms of having a deal because as we know, uh, January 1, things would have been uh, much more messy for the UK. So I, I don't think, you know, I mean, you can look back and say, well, should, should they have withdrawn in the first place? I'm not sure that's a fair argument at this point, but having withdrawn, I think the sooner that they were able to do a deal, the better that they will be. Uh, and frankly, the world economy will be better off by having them have, a, have an agreement because everybody was apprehensive about, you know, what was going to take place on, on that side of the Atlantic. OK, Harry Broadman, unfortunately, we've run out of time and we have to leave it there. But thank you very much for your insight. My pleasure. Now, it is uh, that time of year when millions of families gather around their Christmas trees. In Europe, more than half of the 80 million trees sold this year started out as seeds and they were harvested from the forests of the Republic of Georgia. Its Norman firs are sought after for their aroma and the fact that their needles don't drop off quickly. But the annual harvest isn't for the faint-hearted. The BBC's Rehan Dimitri travelled to the alpine forests of western Georgia to find out more. In the forests of western Georgia is a job that requires a head for heights and calculated risks. Out of 80 million trees sold annually in Europe, more than half begin their journey here. The seeds are harvested from Nordman fir cones in trees up to 50 meters tall. They will be grown in commercial plantations in Europe and sold as Christmas trees in about 12 years' time. Bertie Kublashili works for Danish company Fair Trees. Its harvesters climb with safety ropes, which takes time and patience. I would not advise anyone to climb a tree without the right equipment because many people died, including my friend. My heart aches to think about it. Safety is an important issue and companies operating here in the forests of Racha are making sure that their cone pickers are well equipped and well trained to carry out what is quite a risky business. Accidents can happen. Tengo Donadze was a cone harvester until he fractured his spine last year. The branch betrayed me and I fell. I grasped for another branch. It also broke and I fell about 10 meters. I survived by the grace of God. I will never let my son be a tree climber. God willing, he won't be so poor that he'll be forced to climb a tree to earn a living. Elsewhere in the forest, harvesters working for another Danish company, Levinson, were not using safety ropes to climb. Only a harness at the top. The company says it is working on improving its safety standards. Well, the decision has been made and we are introducing increased level of safety in the tree climbing, simply to avoid any accidents at all. Uh, we don't want accidents. Berdier's team use safety ropes, which slows them down, but their company pays them 1.2 euros per kilo. Other harvesters are paid just 40 cents a kilo. They try to gather as much and as quickly as they can to maximize their earnings. It's a fraction of what is a multi-billion euro industry, but a vital income in the land where Christmas trees grow wild. Rehan Dimitri, BBC News, Racha, Western Georgia.
Wow. Now, 2020 has produced many poignant and powerful photographs. An image of two widowed penguins appearing to comfort one another in Australia has won the Ocean Photography Awards. I don't know if you've seen this. It was taken by Tobias Baumgartner in Melbourne. He was told that the two penguins had recently lost their partners and often appeared to be comforting each other. How beautiful is that? You can get in touch with me. I'm at Luquesa Burag. I shall see you shortly. Well, the government has already come out with, frankly, a very good 10-point plan. They're already implementing this. So what value does this report actually... Um, uh, ...in the future puts us in a stronger position? I think we'll strengthen the case of independence, unfortunately. I think it's going to give um, Nicola Sturgeon more of a platform to go for independence. I think it's, it's just going to boost that whole kind of plan further. After years of dominating our politics, the boundaries of our new relationship with the EU are nearly set. Will it now bring us back together as a country or further break us apart? Jason Farrell, Sky News. My vision presents a win-win opportunity for both sides, a realistic two-state solution that resolves the risk of Palestinian statehood to Israel's security. The Iran deal is defective at its core. Uh, do you think Sleepy Joe could have made this deal, baby? Sleepy Joe. You have been the greatest friend that Israel has ever had in the White House. But with Trump on his way out, Netanyahu is going to have to find other ways to get a political boost. And right now, he really needs one. Of course, if Trump's Middle East peace deal still proves a winner, the Israeli PM might yet manage to weather the storm. But here's what Israel's streets now regularly look like. The protesters' biggest problem with Benjamin Netanyahu is his alleged corruption crimes. He denies any wrongdoing. He's calling the trials politically motivated. But the opposition got a new weapon this year, COVID. Or rather, the nation's fury at the way Netanyahu's been dealing, or maybe failing to deal, with the pandemic. The perception is one of mismanaged lockdowns with businesses and the unemployed left in the lurch. The corruption has so many people involved right now. We need to start on a blank new slate. We need a constitution. We need to limit the terms of the prime minister to two terms at the most. We need to stop the corruption here in Israel. Not only Netanyahu, Netanyahu mainly, but all the government and all this system that doesn't work for us anymore, uh, but uh, is corrupted and working for one person that is trying to escape from his uh, trial. Demonstrations picked up pace in the spring when Netanyahu managed to cling on to power as prime minister. But only thanks to a coalition between his Likud party and Benny Gantz's blue and white alliance. The election rivals tried to get along to get the country through the pandemic. But now the coalition has fallen apart and Israel goes back to the polls in March. It will be the country's fourth Knesset elections in under two years. An election is not the right thing for the country, but it's much better than a paralyzed government. And having politics dictate the management of one of the most severe health and economic crises we've ever known. Netanyahu, like the rest of us, will no doubt be glad to be done with 2020. But come early next year, he could well be looking back nostalgically at the years when Mr. Here Comes Your Golden Heights President was still in the White House. And that is a wrap for now. More great programs get going in moments. Then Dan will be in this very seat at the top of the hour, keeping you in.